Hello everyone. Last week we saw how God has given his, us his word to make to help us make the right choices. This week we will learn on a new lesson. I will read a small introduction and then we'll proceed with the Bible reading. This week we are going to see that if we are truly children of God, we are not alone when we have choices to make. Not only did God give us his word to show us what choices to make, but to ensure our success, he also gave us a helper who the one who will enable us to make the wise choice. Let's see what role this helper was meant to play in our decisions. Their teacher told them he was going to leave and return to the father. What were the disciples to do? For the past three and a half years, Jesus taught and instructed the twelve. Now their teacher was about to be taken away. How would they know what to do? How to carry on? Listen to Jesus' promise, a promise not only for them, but for every person who chooses to believe in Jesus Christ and follow him. So we are going to read John chapter 14 verse 26 and John chapter 16 verse 13 to 14 and mark every reference to the Holy Spirit including the pronouns and synonyms with a cloud. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So you see we have marked a couple of references of the helper. Let's get to John chapter 16 verse 13 to 14. But when he the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take off mine and will dis disclose to you. So let's get to the first question, but before that we will read a small introduction. The, we will read a small inside box. The Greek word translated as helper in John chapter 14 verse 26 is parakletos, a person summoned to one's aid. The term refers to an advisor, a legal advocate, a mediator or intercessor. This helper will direct the disciples' decisions and counsel them continually. According to John chapter 14 verse 26, who is the helper to whom Jesus was referring? So let's look at John chapter 14 verse 26 and see who is the helper. But So, so I'm going to read the, the first part. But the helper, who is the helper? The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. So who is the helper? The Holy Spirit is the helper. Let's get to the next question. What did you learn about the helper from these verses? Who is he? Where did he come from? What did he do? What was his role with the disciples? So we're going to ask the 5W questions here and, and look at uh, extracting as much as information from these couple of verses about the helper. So let's get to the first verse. So we're going to ask the who, when, where, why, what and how. So who is the helper? We found out that the helper was the Holy Spirit. Uh, what's, what else does, uh, does it say about the helper? Whom the Father will send in my name. So we learned that the Father sends the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And what's the responsibility or, or the job description of the helper? He will teach you, which means he will teach us. And he, just as he taught the, the first century disciples, he will teach you all things. And what else does, do we see? And bring to your memory or remembrance, bring to our remembrance all that I said to you. So the, the job of the helper was to bring to the memory and remembrance of the disciples all that Jesus told them or all that Jesus taught them. Let's look at the next verse and see what else we do we learn about the helper. But when he the spirit of truth, so what do we learn about the helper here? He is the helper, his name is Holy Spirit, but here he is mentioned as the spirit of truth. So he the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. So what else does he do? The spirit of truth guides us into all truth, uh, for he will not speak on his own initiative. So the helper would not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, so whatever he hears, he will speak. So the helper speaks not on his own initiative, or the helper does not bring up things by himself, but whatever he hears, so another work of the Holy Spirit is what he hears, the Holy Spirit will speak only what he hears. So he, he hears, he will speak 
and he will disclose to you what is to come. So the, the, the responsibility or the job description of the helper is to disclose to us what is to come, what is to come in the future. Let's get to the next verse and see what else does it mention. He will glorify me. So the Holy Spirit would glorify Jesus. So the me there is Jesus. So the, the, uh, the Holy Spirit would glorify Jesus. He will take of mine. So he will take of what is Jesus and will disclose to us or to disclose to you. Let's get to the next section. One of the many roles of the Holy Spirit is teaching. He instructs from within and recalls to memory the truths that Jesus taught. So he instructs from within. So where is he? He is within. He instructs from within and recalls. He makes us recall to memory the truths that Jesus taught. The Spirit therefore impresses the commandments of Jesus on the minds of his followers and thus prompts them to obedience. Isn't it exciting to see that God has not left you on your own? So in the entire uh, uh, subject that we learned how to make choices, isn't it exciting that God has not left us, all of us on our own and he has given us another helper. It says instead he was, he was given you a helper, one who has come to our aid and will direct our decisions and counsel us continually. So he, will, he has come to our aid, he will direct our decisions and will counsel us continually. What is even more exciting is that we as believers don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to come to us. This is, a, this is a very important part of the paragraph. It says that we as believers do not need to wait for the Holy Spirit to come to us. He is already here, present in the moment. Let's take a look to see where he is. So we're going to take a look at a few verses to see where the Holy Spirit is. We're going to read John chapter 14 verse 16 and 17 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 and chapter 6 verse 19 and the same way keep marking the Holy Spirit. This is a new marking that we are learning today. We mark God the, the Father with a triangle. We mark Jesus with a cross and we will mark the Holy Spirit with a cloud. It's a very simple way of identifying what subject it's talking about. For example, if you look at uh, the one of the advantages of marking is if you look at John, I'm not going to even read it. I'm just going to plainly look at the text of John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. If you look at the text, what marking do you see the most there? Yes, you see the marking of the cloud. So that means that the author is laying emphasis on the on the, the key word that is used there. And the key word there is, is the Holy Spirit and, and the helper. So that's the advantage of marking. When you mark keywords distinctively, it helps us to, to know the emphasis of the author. The author would keep on repeating a certain word to, to or a certain subject or a certain person to lay emphasis on that particular person or subject. So let's read John chapter 14 verse 16 and 17 and the, the subsequent verses in 1 Corinthians and keep marking the helper. I will ask the father and he will give you another helper. So who is speaking here? Jesus. So Jesus is saying, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Let's get to the next verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of the a temple of God? and the, the Spirit of God dwells in you. So it says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? Let's get to the next verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? So let's get straight to the questions. The first question is, John chapter 14 verse 16 to 17 records Jesus speaking to his disciples shortly before his death. So the, the context is that Jesus is speaking here to his disciples. What was his promise with respect to the Holy Spirit in these verses? So let's look at what were the promise of Jesus with respect to the Holy Spirit in these verses. So let's look at the first section or the first few verses that we read. So the promise here is, Jesus is saying, I will ask of the Father. So Jesus is going to ask of his Father. 
and his father will give you another helper. So we see the Trinity here. But out of the Trinity, God the Father is going to give us another helper, the, the, the third person of the Trinity, the helper, and he will be with you forever. So what do we learn? That the Holy Spirit is going to come to us from God the Father because Jesus is asking the Father to send him to us. And this Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to be with us for how long? Forever. That is the spirit of truth. So we see another name here. It's, uh, it is, he's called as the spirit of truth. In one place he's called as the Holy Spirit. Now he is called as the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive. So the world cannot receive. What's the promise here? The world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him. So the promise is that we know the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he abides in you, with you. So he abides with us and will be in you. So he will abide in us. Now let's get to the second uh, portion and see what is the promise. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in us? So the promise is that we are already the temple of God. We who are believers in Christ are already the temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in us. Here again in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, the promise is, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? So that's again what we learn about. That's something else we learn about the Holy Spirit. In the other two verses, the Apostle Paul was writing to Christians living in Corinth of Corinth of what he remind, what did he remind them with respect to the Holy Spirit? So what did the Apostle Paul remind the, the, the Corinth believers with respect to the Holy Spirit? We learn here in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul reminded the Corinthian believers, the Corinth believers, that do you not know, so do you not know, do you not understand that you are that you're a temple of God. So what does he remind? That we are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in us or in you. So we are a temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in us. So he's reminding the Corinthian believers that we are the temple of God. Again, he repeats, he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. In the first place, he says, you are the temple. Here it says, your body is the temple of whom? Of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God. So where did the Holy Spirit come from? From God. And where is he? He is in us. And that you are not our, not, you are not your own. So what else do we learn? That we are not our own. Summarize what you learned from these verses in John and 1 Corinthians regarding the believer's relationship to the Holy Spirit. So let's look at the believer's relationship with the Holy Spirit and see what we can, how we could summarize it. So if you look at John chapter 14 verse 17, it says, This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but it, because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides in you. So what's the relationship? between a believer and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit abides in the believer and he will be in you. The Holy Spirit will be in the believer. Let's get to the next section. Ne the next verse says, do you not know that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? So the Spirit of God dwells within a believer. So if you are a believer of Christ, the Spirit of God dwells within you. Let's get to the next verse. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So here it says that a believer's body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in, in you, who is in us, whom you have received from God. Where did we receive the Holy Spirit from? We received the Holy, Holy Spirit from God and that we are not our own. So what's our relationship with the Holy Spirit? We do not belong to ourselves. We are the temple of God and the Holy is because the Holy Spirit makes his residence in us or abides in us or he is in us in other words. Isn't this exciting? So in the, the previous episode, we saw how God has given us his word, which helps us to make right choices. But here we see God giving us another helper. And this is apart from the word. He gives us another helper. Isn't that exciting? God's spirit will be in you and me forever, guiding and teaching us. We don't have to call and make an appointment. We don't have to wait for his arrival in order to make a decision. We have seen in the previous passages how God has demonstrated his love for us, helping us to succeed in our walk with him by the wonderful provision. So God has, has provided for us, us and helps us to succeed by giving us this wonderful provision of the Holy Spirit. 
he has made in sending his Holy Spirit. So he has made a provision by sending his Holy Spirit. God's Spirit dwells with us forever, guiding us, teaching us in the ways of truth and righteousness in all that we do. Therefore, we no longer have to make choices on our own. So we do not have to make choices on our own. But what is our responsibility to be in all of this? So let's look at our responsibility in all of this now. So the Holy Spirit, remember that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He will guide you and counsel you. But what's your responsibility? Let's take a look at the book of Galatians for the answer to that question. So we're going to read Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 18. And keep marking the Holy Spirit with the cloud. But there is another reference of the flesh. So we put a slash on the flesh. So two markings here. But I say to you, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So I'm reading Galatians 5 verse 16 and 18. But I say to you, walk by the spirit. So I here is Paul and he is, he is telling the Galatians or he is writing to the Galatians. But I say to you, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So we mark the spirit. We also mark the flesh. For the flesh sets his desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So what do we learn here? Uh, let's get to the questions and see if we can uh, learn a few things from this text. Before I go there, read a small inside box. The word walk in this passage means to behave, conduct yourself, lead a life. So let's look at that passage and see uh, what it says. So, but I say to you walk. So it's basically meaning walk by the spirit. In other words, it says that you behave yourself, you conduct yourselves and lead a life. It is in the present tense in the Greek indicating a continual habitual action. So it's not a one time action in the past, but it's a continual habitual action. What did you learn from marking the reference to the spirit? So let's get to the First question and look at the markings of the spirit. In all three verses, we have the spirit marked and uh, we will see what we can learn about the spirit. So Paul is saying, I say to you, walk by the spirit. So we need, we as believers need to walk by the spirit. And if we walk by the spirit, what's the result? You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So in other words, how do we not carry out the desires of the flesh? By walking in the spirit. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. So we see here an opposition or, or two opposing factors or two opposing uh, powers working in a believer's life. The flesh and the spirit. So what do we learn about the flesh and the spirit? The flesh desires against the spirit. Sets its desire or is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit is contrary to the flesh. The spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So these two things, these two factors are in opposite. They are opposite in nature or opposite in, in their role or desires. And uh, they, uh, it says they are opposite to one another so that you may not do things that you please. So the flesh would set its desire against the spirit so that we would not do things that we please. What else do we learn? If you are led by the spirit, so it says that what do we learn about the spirit? We can be led by the spirit. And what's the, the effect of that? You are not under the law. So it, if we are led by the spirit, we don't fall under the law. Let's get to the next question. According to this passage, who is responsible for our decisions and behavior? Give the reason for your answer. So according to this passage, who is responsible for our decisions and behavior? Give the reason for your answer. Let's look at the passage again. But I say to you, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So uh, who is responsible here in verse 16? You are right. We are responsible. As believers, we are responsible to walk by the Spirit. Because you see in verse 16, that's an instruction. And uh, uh, the instruction is that we need to walk by the Spirit. And if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh. If the Holy Spirit is leading you, how will His presence affect the choices you make? So let's look at the choices we make here. And if the Holy Spirit will lead us, how will it affect the choice? So and remember the entire topic of the discussion and the, the episode is how to make choices you won't regret. So let's look at 
us look at how the Holy Spirit will enable us to make the right choice if we are walking in the Spirit. So it says, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. So we, in other words, we will not carry out the desire of the flesh in making wrong choices in our life. But what is the condition? We walk by the Spirit. What else does it say? In verse 18, it says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So if we are led by the Spirit, we will not make decisions and be under the law. We will not make wrong choices and be, be under the law. Let's get to the next section. How can people determine whether or not they are walking by the Spirit? So how do we know whether we are walking by the Spirit? Let's see what we can learn from Galatians 5. So we're going to read a small portion in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21. And mark the flesh the same way with a slash and the spirit with a cloud. And uh, uh, we will also, along with this, also number the deeds of the flesh. So we are going to mark the flesh, but we are also numbering the deeds of the flesh. So verse 19, Galatians chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. Now the deeds of the flesh, so when we mark flesh, are evident, which are immorality. So if you can number immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you. Just as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the, let's get to the questions here. The first three deeds of the flesh deal with what kinds of sins. So let's look at the first three deeds of the flesh and see what kind of sins does it deal with. Can we categorize the three the three deeds of the flesh into one category? Let's look at it. Immorality, impurity, and sensuality. How does that how does that how does that uh, uh, seem to you? Or, or or what can we what can in one word how would you characterize that? Yes, yeah, sexual sexual impurity or sexual sin. Let's look at the next question. Discuss how knowing this will affect the choices you make concerning the things you read. So. Uh, in knowing this, how would it affect the choices of what we read, uh, watch, listen, where, listen to and where? So, will it affect? Yes, it will affect. If we know that these are the deeds of the flesh, we will we will change the way we dress. We will we will uh, be mindful of what we see and hear and we read. Uh, let's get to the next question. How will knowing this affect your speech and your relationship? Knowing this will affect our speech and relationship because we will not go according to the deeds of the flesh. We will not live in according to the, the, fruit, the deeds of the flesh which are evident. Immorality, impurity and sensuality, sensuality. We know where it comes from. We know that it is the deed of the flesh. The next two deeds, number 4 and 5 of the flesh, deal with religious sins. What are they? Let's look at number 4 and 5 and see the religious sins. Verse 20, the first two, idolatry and sorcery. So these are religious sins or these are the sins that be, that can be categorized as a religious sin. So idolatry and sorcery. Idols include not only statues and false gods, but anything more important than your walk with God. So what's the definition of an idol? Anything that takes the place of God and not it, it need not be a statue, it need not be false gods, but Anything that takes the place of God is more important than your walk with God. What kind of things can become idols in your life? Let's let's examine and see what kind of things can become idols in your life. Uh, could be a could be a smartphone because that's a, a, a big addiction today, right? So a smartphone can become your idol. A, a celebrity image, whether he is from he or she is from a cinema or sports figure, can become your idol. What else can become idols? The, you tend to spend more time with your idol, with the idol. Uh, that can be an idol. Where you, where it takes away your time, that can be your idol. So it's an application question. What are the idols uh, uh, in your life? Let's ask ourselves a question. Based on this passage and your knowledge of God's word, what decision should be made concerning psychic hotlines, auger boards, horoscopes, and the like? Is white magic acceptable? What about Halloween, tarot cards, Vika? If these things involve sorcery, do they have a place in a believer's life? Obviously no. 
would the spirit of god lead you into these things would the spirit of god lead you into these things obviously no the third group of idols number 6 and 2 through 13 are tied to our interactions with others some call these deeds social offenses discuss each one and how it affects the choices we make for example road rage and other fairly recent trends indicate anger is a major problem these days so we know with the increase of road rage we know that anger is a major problem that we are dealing with today according to this passage is it acceptable to explode at someone in anger so is it acceptable to explode at someone in anger what if someone's actions provoked your anger so let's look at the the first part of the question and uh, number 6 to 13 and see what kind of what kind of sins are mentioned here so the first three is in verse 19 the first two uh, is another category in verse 20 now we are looking at verse 20 the 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 the, the fourth one or the sorry the fifth one and the sixth one the enmities it mentions as enmities so it's a social evil or social sin uh, strife social sin because it involves more than one person jealousy outbursts of anger disputes dissensions factions so even the the it also uh, uh, says factions where you 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 uh, separate and make a faction of yourself so factions envying uh, envy is to envy somebody else or to be jealous it's it's part of jealousy drunkenness okay so we'll get into drunkenness uh, in the next question discuss the last two deeds number 14 and 15 of the flesh what are they and how do they impact the lives of others and choices we make does this list cover every deed of the flesh explain your answer from what you see in the text so let's get to the last two and see what are they and how do they impact the lives of others so what are the last two do we see in the last two here drunkenness it says drunkenness and carousing now let's look at the definition of carousing let's look at what it means to be carousing carousing is basically carousing means uh, 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 alcohol parties parties that uh, involve uh, drinking or uh, drinking to a, a great extent to a big extent and enjoying uh, people together enjoying with each other so that's called carousing so drunkenness and carousing is what we see in the last part the word translated as practice is in the present tense in the greek so uh, when it says practice it is in the present tense those who practice for example it says those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of god so it's a present tense that is mentioned there this means habitual continuation of fleshly deeds as opposed to isolated lapses so it's not isolated lapses but habitual continuation of fleshly deeds it does not mean that a christian who falls into a single sin loses his salvation so that's not the meaning of the text the strong contrast shows that those who continually practice such sins give evidence of never having received god's holy spirit so those who continually practice the evidence uh, of not receiving the holy spirit is seen in their lives according to verse 21 what will happen to those who practice these things so let's look at verse 21 and see what will happen to those who practice these things so it says in the last part of 21 it says that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of god they will not inherit the kingdom of god so that's the answer let's get to the next section galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 25 and we will read the uh, and mark the flesh with the slash and the spirit with a cloud and we will get to the questions but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self control against such things there is no law now those who belong to christ jesus have crucified the flesh so mark flesh which is with its passions and desires if we live by the spirit let us also walk by the spirit let's get to the first question 
the word but signals a contrast. What is being contrasted in this passage? So if you look at the word but, it is a contrast. So what is it contrast? So the contrast that we see here is the, the previous passage talks about the deeds of the flesh and here it talks about the fruit of the spirit. So the contrast is between the deeds of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. In verse 22, what does the singular verb is tell you about the fruit of the spirit? So if you look at verse 22, there's the singular verb is used, which is the fruit and it's not uh, in plural. What does it tell you? It tells us that it is the fruit, it is a fruit uh, that comes from living in the spirit. There, and it, it's it's a package, it's, a, it's different facets of the, this, the fruit uh, that comes with living in the spirit or the fruit of the spirit. How many aspects of the fruit of the spirit are there? So how many different aspects of the fruit do we see here? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And this is completely nine. So we see nine aspects of the fruit of the spirit here. What is the fruit of the spirit and what makes it possible for believers to have this fruit evident in their lives? In answering this question, you might want to see every place you mark the spirit. So we will look at what is the fruit of the spirit and what makes it possible for believers to have this fruit evident in their lives. So let's look at what makes it possible. Now, we saw the fruit of the spirit in verse 22 and 23, but verse 24 says, now those who belong to Christ. So what, what, makes, us, what makes it possible for us to have the fruit of the spirit? It says those who belong to Christ. So for number one, we need to belong to Christ. What the, what happens when we belong to Christ? We number two, what we learn is those who have belonged to Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. So we learned the in the previous passage we learned about the different deeds of the flesh. So we have crucified its passions. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the passions and desires. They've all it's in the past tense. So they have already crucified. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. So and they, what else do we learn here? That we need to live by the Spirit, so we will also walk by the Spirit. Let's get that to the next question. How will being aware of the fruit of the Spirit help you to make choices when faced with difficult circumstances? So how would we be aware of how to behave in difficult circumstances? Is it possible to have joy peace and patience. Yes, it is possible because that's the fruit of the spirit. And if you look at the, the verse which says that those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh. So whatever difficult time we go through, if we have crucified, if, if you belong to Christ, you have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. So passions and desires include anger and any kind of, kind of outrage. So we have already crucified. Crucified means it is already dead and it is no longer alive. How will you know that, that self-control is the fruit of the spirit affect your choices concerning sexual desires? The way you eat, the time you spend surfing the net. So it needs uh, self-control is another fruit of the spirit. And, and how will that affect our sexual desires or, or, or uh, our thoughts when it comes to sexuality? The way we eat, the way you eat, the time we send, spend surfing the net, uh, the, uh, the things that you choose to watch, and participate in or the time you spend playing video games. So does it affect? It has to affect, it will affect. Let's wrap it up uh, and read. I will read a, a portion of, of the uh, chapter and we will wrap up the entire episode. According to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14, every believer has the spirit of God dwelling in them. So what do we learn here? That every believer has the spirit of God dwelling in them. The Holy Spirit is present to direct your decisions and counsel you continually. He teaches and brings to remembrance the things the Lord has said. He dwells within you and glorifies God. You no longer have to make choices on your own. He will guide you and direct you if you will listen. As we have seen, victory comes when you obey the Spirit's leading and the Word of God. Failure is a result of not consistently meditating on the Word and listening to the Holy Spirit. 
let me repeat this failure is the result of not consistently meditating on the word of god in other words meditating on the word of god would get us success would lead us to success and listening to the holy spirit will also listen, uh, will also give us success choices flow out of world views and world views out of whatever we feed our minds the choices flow out of world views and world views with whatever we feed our mind remember that jesus knew god's word and clung to it when faced with temptation and as a result god god blessed him and us david however knew the word of god yet chose to ignore it and follow his own desires the consequences were tragic you have been given the resources the word and the holy spirit the choice is yours will you walk according to the word of god being led by the spirit or will you choose to disregard the spirit's leading and follow after your own fleshly desire so we have two options here is to walk according to the word of god and uh, or to disregard the spirit's leading and follow our own fleshly desires if you choose to sin remember that you can't choose where sin will lead you so if you choose to sin we cannot choose where sin will lead us a choice for instant gratification of our your fleshly desire can bring consequences that last a lifetime even worse it can bring death to you or to those who those who you love on the other hand friend should you choose to walk according to the word being led by the spirit god will bless you more than you have ever imagined possible let me close here that god if we live by the word and by led by the spirit if we walk according to the word and are being led by the spirit god will bless us more than we have ever imagined may this be true of us as we close this episode we saw the story of david we learned a lot from the example of david and bathsheba and the wrong choices he made we saw how nathan the prophet confronted david with his sin but we also saw in episode 3 how david repented through psalm 51 and david repented of his sin he had a genuine repentance of his sin we saw in the in the in the previous episode we saw the difference of of uh, how the word of god is given to us to make the right choice we saw the story of adam and eve and in this chapter in in this episode we saw how god has given us another helper the very the very essence of his nature he has given us the third person of of his nature or of his person the third person is given to us he lives in us he abides with us for us to make right choices may we keep making right choices and be blessed may god bless you get in touch call us on plus 9186550833302 or email us at info@preceptindia.org you can also find us on www.preceptindia.org god bless you